What reels do you guys run? Um, I'm all of Okuma's. Uh, your Shimano, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pretty much all old style Talors or Dakotas, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. Just another point to Shane about rod management. Um, and I know probably a lot of you, you go out with a buddy, there's two of you on the boat, that's probably most common for wreck anglers. One guy runs his side of the boat, the other guy runs his other side of the boat. You know, you're trying to rigger and a diver or a rigger and a board or whatever. But um, when we turn the fish, we're always mindful of what everybody's running. You really want the whole boat, like Shane talked about, that meat pattern. You want it to run together in unison. So, you know, I'm not going to be running my dogger at 150 and he's running his dogger at 150. Or both our riggers are at the same depth, right? You want to spread those things out. We never run our digger. Our, our riggers are always 10 feet apart, um, minimum. And even if the one rigger, your <coughs> rigger's getting bit, getting bit, getting bit, I'm not going to lower that other one to interfere with that because sometimes I feel like that might shut that down. That said, if that rigger fires, you know, your 100 foot deep rigger, bang, the other one goes down immediately because there could be a school of fish there, which is there you might double up. But again, it's just, uh, you know, even if you're, you and your buddy are doing, you're running to your side, he's running his side, just be mindful of where each other is in the water column. So you can kind of spread that out and cover all your depths so that you know, catch on to things you know, when something's successful. Then very good point, very good point. The, uh, the other part to it as well, you'll find when you're watching your graph, having two riggers, okay, and the lines are going across your graph like this, and you'll see fish going on the, the one and then move down to the other, you know where that fish is going, right? And it really helps to try to focus in on what bait to run, you know, what bait is getting looked at, what's pulling fish in, so again, like, you know, we talked about a spread, right? Uh, all these rods that we've just put out. All of these rods have attracting qualities and triggering qualities to getting bites. They're not all equal, right? So you may have baits that pull fish into a spread, but it may not actually get bit. It might be something else that gets bit, right? So you're trying to figure this all out together you know again like you said if you're running one side of the boat against the other side of the boat you're defeating yourself you're almost cutting your productivity in half use the entire boat the whole spread to your advantage it's like running a football team you have your offensive line and only going to use half of your offensive line right this is not going to work right so the same kind of thing where you know you're, you're going to run your whole spread where it's going to uh, work together to be able to catch fish. Um, we often use the idea of almost like a parade, right? Um, as you're parading your baits through, you want to bring the attention to them right under the boat, get them interested, get them thinking about feeding, and then all the baits that follow behind it is these things that are second option, okay? Third option, fourth option. And you try to try to suck in the fish and catch them on the way out um, so you know often that's that means you know sometimes it's a higher rigor than what they're living in you'll see them they'll come in it's on a short lead uh, getting their attention to come up and then they'll disband and then your second rigor is a little bit deeper maybe a little bit further back and then your divers and then your lead cores and your coppers right so you, you got that whole uh, paraded action to uh, to be able to you know get these fish to to bite somewhere along the way yeah good talk on that um, when it comes to uh, size of boat uh, we talked at the beginning that we both started in smaller size boats and uh, you know we've uh, you, you certainly uh, have lots of time on bigger boats I've I've had plenty of time as well on bigger boats but I still operate a small boat. And there's advantages and disadvantages, I find, for, for either or. Now, you can imagine, you know, a big boat certainly has the advantage in rough conditions, right? Being comfortable in choppy conditions is the, is the advantage. But there's also other advantages, too, of the big boat, I find. So, for an example, you have much more space, right? You have more space in the back of the boat to be able to maneuver and, and get, you know, uh, rods moved around, but also 
anglers that are fighting fish, you know, and move them over to one side while the guy's netting the fish on the other, or whatever it might be. Uh, small boats, we have advantages as well. And one of the biggest advantages I find is that we have the opportunity to trailer our boats to the port that is best. A big boat has to spend a lot of gas money in order to get to productive water sometimes throughout the season. Um, if you're stuck on a dock and uh, the fishing is 12 miles down the lake, you're going to be burning a lot of fuel, right? Um, so a trailerable boat is certainly helpful for that. You go down to that port and launch and then get onto those fish in a short period of time. You're going to be watching your weather, of course, the windows of opportunity uh, with a smaller boat, but you can certainly, uh, you know, uh, focus in on where the fishing's best. Just because you have a ramp pass to some place doesn't mean you're anchored and needing to go to that ramp each and every time you deploy your, or you launch your boat, all right? You have that mindset, then you're already putting yourself at a disadvantage to catching fish. So be, uh, you know, be mobile. Yeah, I, I know lots of folks, you know, that trailer the boat around to Toronto when the bite's good there, or all the way around to Newcastle and, and they fish to the east. Um, they'll leave at, you know, two in the morning just to get there for first light, right? And that's where it's at. If you want good fishing, you focus your time on getting your boat there behind the truck rather than across the lake. Yeah. One tip too for small boats, if uh, you're riding them and you do get in a situation where you're a little bit of rough water, I don't know if you run trolling bags, but if you run trolling bags, even one on each side, it will, it'll, it'll settle your troll, right? You won't be as smashed your line as much as that. Yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll settle your line. Yeah. yeah, so it's just a little tip. If you, even if you got one, throw it out, you'll find it to be a little mm -hmm. bit different. Yeah. yeah, another advantage to the small boat, often we have bow mount electric trolling motors. And that becomes your autopilot. So the big boats, they have autopilot that's, you know, operating the direction of the boat with the stern, right? Meanwhile, electric trolling motor on the bow is doing a lot of the steering. And it's actually more effective from the bow to steer your boat at slower speeds. It's quite good. Yeah, so big boats and small boats, you know, a lot of people will say, well, on a big boat, you can run more rods. That's not the case at all. A small boat can run just as many rods. It's all about rod management and where you place those rods so they don't get uh, into a big mess. There was a question up here. I was going to ask, um, have you seen any like, scale extensions for your trolling motor up front? Yes. Yes, I've seen some of that. Did you have one? Yeah. Yeah, they're fantastic. Are they? Yeah. So a perfect example, yeah. So you can you can add uh, an extension to your ke uh, your keel on your uh, electric trolling motor. It's like a plate. Is that what yours is? Yeah. About the size of uh, I don't know, about twelve inches by. Not quite that. Big. Six. Yeah. Something like that. No. The biggest advantage is um, I don't need to use my battery to pull the boat. I'm just using the battery to steer. So it's a bigger rudder, catches more water. I'm not running my electric at, you know, two or three or whatever four setting you need. I'm running, I only, I just steer it. That's it. Yeah, I see what you mean. It's yeah. a rudder. Yeah. It's a rudder only. Yeah. Now there's a, a few other things too. So electric trolling, trolling motor um, that you get straight out is generally designed to cut through weeds and all that stuff fandangle bass fishing stuff um, wonderful you know if that's what you do up north and whatnot but there are other props that you can get that pull water better and uh, Kippewa props if you're interested uh, they have like a three blade that is excellent for electric trolling motors bigger blades uh, and they pull a whole lot more water so if you had like a keel uh, it's really just a steering device on the bow but on top of that, if you had a, a better prop too to pull pull more water with uh, slower rev, uh, revolutions, uh, you you probably get a little more product productivity too with your your boat control. Are you running a kicker or just 
using the yes. electric. You're going to yeah. kicker too. So the kicker motor will only be stationary the whole day, uh, pushing you straight. All of your your directional uh, travel is done on the electric trolling motor. Um, the only time that I often will you know turn the wheel all of a sudden is when you have a wily salmon that's coming in and doing something erratic and you want to avoid you know getting into a rigger or whatever uh, do a quick spin on the back end that's kind of the the, the purpose that we would you can use, use the trolling motor for that just head it in the direction you can it just it doesn't react quite as fast in the back yeah but you, you're right yes yeah just your general direction is from the electric trolling motor yep um, in a smaller boat um, I'm thinking about putting a kicker on myself mm -hmm. because the boat's so small and when you're in the cockpit you're so close to the back there, would it be pointless to get it hooked up to your main engine because using a steering wheel? Yeah, if you have an electric trolling motor, you yeah. you can get away with not having it tied in. And save a couple bucks. Yeah, but there are cheaper ways of doing that. So there's like a Panther connection that you can use, has like little cam locks that will okay. click into, uh, so it's, it's not like a it's fully a mechanized or... system. Uh, it's really just a rod, a steering rod that will go back and forth. Okay. Um, I so mine only for 30 bucks. Yeah. 30 bucks, yeah. And then my rail craft got that too. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's easy. Air yep. disconnects. There was a question back here? I thought I saw a hand pop up. Nope, I guess not. <laughs> All right. Yep. The iPilot. Mm -hmm. What happens when it goes wrong? <laughs> what happens when it goes wrong? <laughs> when it breaks down, is that what you mean? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes that'll. Uh, I've I've seen it, uh, and you're you're frantically trying to shut it off. <laughs> and it's it's buzzing, trying to stop the boat while you're trolling. Yeah. Yeah, it's it can be a pain. Sometimes I run in, I run up to the bow and I pull the plug, and then reset, and it's it's good. Um, but yeah, I've I've had that same situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it happens sometimes. Um, all right, yeah. Let's so let's move on uh, to a little bit about you know differences in style of fishing. So you know we we we're hearing from Daryl a lot about his tactics on. Uh, Charter, uh, sorry, on uh, tournament fishing, but there really is different ways that we all approach fishing uh, when we're out. There. <coughs> and uh, you know, from your perspective of uh, you know targeting the biggest fish for a tournament, let's say for an example, maybe different tactics than let's say a charter captain or a recreational guy that wants to go out there and just catch fish with his family, right? So just being mindful of that sometimes. You know, you hear numbers from certain anglers of how many fish they've caught, you know, and, and they may say, oh, yeah, I got 15 for 20 today. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. And then you'll have another angler, I got two today, but they were pretty darn good. <laughs> they were big bites, right? So your tactic of what you're fishing for, how you fish for them, can be completely different. And uh, it's not a, I, I would say, a, not a judgment of, the the, um, the effectiveness of your catch rate, right? Um, you know, if you want to spend the time for a trophy, you're likely going to put your time in to get a big bite, and you're going to be doing things that are slightly different than somebody that, say, for an example, myself, where I'm taking clients out and we need to get fish. We want to catch more fish. Uh, we're trying to get more bites, and we'll we'll be doing different things, going to different places in the lake that will provide that experience more so than let's say one big giant big fish bite and that may be the only bite you get in that whole trip so yeah I, I say for yourselves if you're going out in any particular day kind of get an idea of what it is that your expectation level is right are you going out there for a big fish or you just want to catch fish or you're just enjoying your day out there on the water right your expectation of the catch is really what's going <coughs> to transcend to what you end up doing in any particular day and how you uh, how you approach your day your strategy um, you know I have a lot of friends that are 
you know, strictly derby or tournament fishermen, kudos to them. They really put in their time to get a big fish. Sometimes not necessarily getting numbers, but they're certainly targeting big fish. Yeah. Anything that you can add to no, that? No, you're absolutely right. Um, sometimes as a tournament, more so as a tournament angler, I'm always concentrating on king sand, right? And that's what we're targeting. Um, if I want to catch more fish, I'm probably throwing up more spoons, fishing my baits higher, um, but you know, it's just kind of my mindset. So whatever works for you, um, there's lots of fish in the lake and different ways to catch them for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about net and fish? Um, yeah, we can talk a little bit about that. Um, most of, I think I grabbed one here somewhere. So most guys have a net minder on their, on their nets. Everyone knows what that is. Or you can just run a release clip with a little bit of ma uh, not masking tape, but a little bit of electrical tape and a release clip on a piece of mono. So basically, I saw someone nine that didn't know. You're, you're basically just clipping this clip. This is a, it's made by Scotty specifically for that. There's a diagram on the back where you slide this over top of uh, the actual arm of the net, and then you hook it up. So basically, when you go to net your fish, you don't want that bag in the water because that bag is going to go in front, it's going to get caught on the hooks of the fish, and then you're probably going to end up with a mess and losing the fish to pull the hooks out. Um, so yeah, get, using something like that is good. Some guys will just hold the net in one hand and hold the bag and kind of net, but these things are super handy and, and easy to make up out of just a simple release clip. Um, the other thing that I wanted to touch on too is when you're netting fish, and this kind of goes with rod management, is we like to clean up the back of the boat. We're basically making a path for that fish. So if you've got a, a big king on or any king, they're pretty erratic, right? And you know, especially in the spring when that water's cold, they'll get close to the boat and they can run, you know, 20 feet that way, 20 feet that way. We like to take our rigger rods, and if you've got the space, if you've got rod holders to the side next to your gypsy rod, we'll take our rigger rods and move them into the gypsy rods. And we'll tighten them down as tight as we can get so we get the tip right under the water the same on the other side. So now you've got the entire back of the boat clean. So that fish comes up through the center, he's not going to get tangled in amongst your rigger rods. Um, sometimes if it's a really big fish, an important fish, we'll even take our riggers and we'll swing them around to the <coughs> side of the boat so you get that the cable going to the front of the boat and straight down so you're making even more room. Um, sometimes the fish is hooked in the corner of mouth and you know he'll be coming in on one side and he's just, he, it doesn't matter what you do, he can't get into the back of the boat, he's coming in the corner, we'll take our diver rod, and we'll maybe move that over to the other side where the rigger was and put it there. So now you've got that whole area clear. Um, so just kind of, it avoids those unnecessary tangles or bite offs, you know, he gets in amongst that rigger cable and you can basically kiss him goodbye. Yeah. Um, <coughs> the other thing that I like to do too is, after the, after the fish is netted, and I see this quite often, videos and stuff, <coughs> especially with divers. Um, people will let their diver go, at, the rod could be on the ground or it's in the rod holder and the diver's flopping around at the top <coughs> and the guy's trying to get the, the hook out of the fish and that's a good way if it's wavy that he's going to snap that and that hook's going to drive into your hand or something. So typically if I'm on the rod afterwards, I open, open up my bale, I got my clicker on and I lower this down and I place it underneath here. There's a couple of different ways you can do it. On um, these Dakotas, they got that. Um, usually you can stop in it and then just set it in the rod holder. So now you've got your 10 foot lead, it's on the floor. <coughs> now if another rod fires, you're not tripping over this rod to go get or tripping over the line, less like, likely someone's gonna get a, a hook in the hand. Yeah. So again, it's just a matter of trying to keep that area clean. You don't want to break a rod or anything like that. Yeah, yeah that's a great, great point. If you're, you know, on all the rods, really, the rigger rods even, uh, is just, again, clicker is going to be on. Free spool, put it in the rod holder, now deal with the fish on the floor. Mm -hmm. Now the rod's up there, it's out of the way, and it's not going to have any tension, right? It's free spool, but with the clicker so it doesn't over spool when, you know, if you all of a sudden tug on the line. It doesn't give you a big, big bird's nest. Uh, another part to that as well. Um, so big boats and small boats. And we talked a little bit about 
the leader lengths that we have behind our divers sometimes are very long. So this is where it becomes a bit of a teamwork of you know the, the fellow that's on the, the rod, of course, uh, but also you have one person that will be doing a hand bomb job, right? Trying to keep the tension straight. You know, oh, the fish is going to pull again. Okay, all right, let go again. And the diver's going out. And then he's going to do that again, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's all communicated in the boat as well, right? So the, the fellow that's on the rod, on a small boat, we can go right up to the front of the bow, right? Rod straight up like this. And you got the hand bomber to do his, do his thing and then the netter is ready to go again. So the net minder is really handy for that. Um, but one thing about netting fish, you know, I often see it, you know, people get excited. They got a big fish, oh, it's in the back of the boat. Oh my <coughs> goodness. So they'll stab at a fish when it's not ready. Uh, be, be really, really, you know, patient. Make sure that fish is ready to be netted. The head's coming up at you. Um, it's starting to rise. They're not coming, you know, you see a fish that's green and it, you know, it's going to dart and, and you're going to miss the fish. Wait for it. Wait for it to come up on its side, head towards you, and then go for the head. Don't go for the tail. You scoop at the tail, you're going to lose that fish. It's going to spook them off every time. Yep. My, my kids like to hit me in the head at the end of the <laughs> 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 Yeah. Yeah, so it's a, it's a lot of fun though. You get a you get a fish uh, in the net. Um, another thing too, as well, uh, a lot of folks will lift a net up like this and bring it on board. Don't do that. It's not good for the net. Um, you know, bring the net in like this and then lift it up on the hoop like this because a big fish like that will bend your net, and it's just it's a lot of pressure on the fish as well, um, and uh, you get them in the boat a lot easier they also won't be able to flop out. So sometimes if you net a fish and lift them up like this and they're still caught up on the netting, they're gonna flip flop and you have no leverage. You can't hold a fish like that doing that. They'll flop out of the net. So just try to get it as vertical as, as quickly as possible when they're in the bottom and bring them in the boat like that. It's, it, it'll save you, save you your net, but also save a few fish too. Yeah. yeah. At that point, uh, yep, question, yep. Um, what do you recommend for reviving the fish? Mm. You got one here. So excellent, uh, what, what we tend to do is tow these fish along. So after we've unhooked them, uh, we'll tow them behind the boat and let them revive on their own. Without having to hold, I mean, you can imagine water being as cold as it is in, the, in the early May, your, your hand's gonna get cold just holding the fish. So we have these uh, Press over grips. grips. Um, the beauty of this, it's all stainless steel. They're the most expensive on the market. There's other makes that will do the same thing, but this is, you know, it's going to hit it. But it's not, this has been in the water thousands of times. Basically, you just hook that up to the fish, and then we hook that around a rod holder, and then just let it out. You know, and he goes back in the water immediately. So, and then, you know, you just kind of watch him. You'll know he'll go straight up, and he looks like he's swimming with the boat. And then he's good to go. He just reaches over, release that, and he's gone. Um, more so in the warmer water. When, when you're, you're, you know, right through to May, mid-May, when your water's still only 55 on the surface, or even in the summer when you're fishing the North Shore, sometimes you get those big blows. Your surface can be, you know, 50 degrees over there. Those fish, just throw them back. They're going to be fine. You don't have to tow them around. Where it comes in really handy is in the fall when we're fishing, you know, 72 degree water. And those kings need to be revived. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. How long do you have your revival? Um, this is what I use, but again, just you can just have it to whatever length you want. You just want the fish to be this to be in the water, so the fish can swim behind the boat, beside the boat. You don't want it to get it into your rigger cable though. You just got to be mindful of that. Um, you don't want them tangling up in that. But yeah. Yeah, you'll, you'll watch the fish uh, to know when to release it. You know, the fish will often, when you first put them in, they'll be on their side like this, right? And then you'll start to see them start to go a little bit more. And then you'll start to see them try to wander a bit. Yeah. So typically that's when it's time, okay? And then when you do, you pull them in, you unhook the boga grip, 
and then you give them a, a good torpedo into the water to give them that uh, rush of water through their gills and it gets them going downward uh, and, and keeps them swimming downward. That's the thing. You don't want to go too high. I find if you go like this and go like this, the fish will just do this. Just do it nice and short, like that. It works works it's better. better. Or just in case I lose it. Or oh, okay. Yeah. Just so yeah. 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 Here, here first. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they do have a pressure release too that you set down. On. Oh, down to use it on a downrigger. Yeah. I've seen those too. I've not I've used it. That, yeah. yeah. That's the one we have. Son lost it and he had to dive in after. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Yep. Uh, is there a time frame that you can use that you have it on that, that mechanism and it's not reviving that you, you realize, hey, um, yeah. yeah. Especially in, you know, when you're fishing that warm water. Well, that would be that time frame. You, you'll or notice the fish was just not. Well, it's not corresponding, not upright. Yeah, that's right. After like that's five, ten right. minutes, and it's not upright still, it's likely so spent. Five to ten, then? Yeah, I would yeah. say. You'll notice in their eye. So I always, you know, take a look at their eye. You'll know a fish is not doing well because its eye will look almost dilated and it just, it's not quite the same. When they're, when they're thinking about, uh, um, be, you know, coming to life and, and doing their thing, you'll see their eye is just like kind of looking around and it's, it's, yeah, it's certainly a different liveliness you'll see. Yeah. yeah. Maybe just, I don't know what you had planned to wrap, but I just thought what expectations for this spring. I'll just give my quick thoughts mm -hmm. on that and maybe Shane can as well. So no ice on Erie again this year. It's been the same thing for the past two years. Um, Typically, what I found is, you know, pre-COVID, when we had high water, areas in Grimsby, Charles Daly, and Jordan all seemed to set up really well. Since then, we've had low water, um, and the last few years, it's really been the Niagara Bar, one of the best places to fish, because that Niagara River water's coming down. The canal sets up a little bit, but I mean, I don't know if your spring last year, but Port Toulouse yeah. wasn't very good, and there wasn't much fish until later on, uh, further to the west. So um, expectations are that the Niagara Bar will be really good again, as it has been the last few years. So that's my thoughts on it. I, I totally agree. It, it, I really do think, and the funny thing about what I've seen over the past, I would say, three years, um, is that the Niagara, the plume, 